All right, folks, welcome back. Steve Malzberg Show. And uh, we have on our panel right now uh, the one and only uh, Peter Morisi, uh, of course, uh, professor at the University of Maryland, economist, Newsmax contributor, and John Gizzi, uh, who's making me dizzy, um, <laughs> Newsmax Washington, D.C. correspondent. All right, let's talk about Condoleezza Rice. And let's talk about what she decided to do over the weekend. She was invited as a commencement speaker at Rutgers University in uh, New Jersey, where I live, unfortunately. And uh, she backed out because uh, from the get-go, about 200 professors, quote unquote, uh, clamored for her not to be there, to disinvite her, and protested, and a handful of students also, and they went and had a sit-in uh, in somebody's office the other day. So she didn't want to be the focal point anymore. She didn't want to take away from the graduation, and she, uh, she backed out of it. Uh, what do you think, uh, uh, John? Should she have done this, and what does it say about Rutgers? Well, I personally have uh, no problem with speaking to I'm not speaking to thousands of people and having my words disrupted, sometimes interrupted, but not being treated boorishly by a large crowd. Now remember, I'd add one postscript to your remarks and summation of the events, Steve. She declined $35,000, which is what she would have been right. paid for making that address. Right. And the other point is, there seems to be a greater pattern of speakers on campus being subjected to abusive treatment. David Petraeus being a recent example uh, to the point where students were following him as he was leaving. Oh, my God. They followed him across into the street where the cars are and said murderer and uh, no security around the poor guy. It was, it was scary. And my feeling is Dr. Rice is someone I had the pleasure of covering at the White House when she was National Security Advisor, Secretary of State. She has an impressive resume, has taught for more than three decades. She really doesn't need it. And uh, I congratulate her for declining. And she has the peace of mind and is comfortable with herself. That's fine. Peter? Well, it is her choice in the end. And uh, part of the decision, if I were in her shoes, would rest on what kind of security and what kind of environment the president of the university could ensure me. And uh, likely, it was going to be the kind of environment that Petraeus had. Uh, one of the things that we have is profoundly weak and political university presidents these days. Uh, they're very good at uh, arousing student support. If there's any threat at all from a board that they might be held accountable for what the students learn, witness what happened at the University of Virginia about two years ago. Uh, and so given the kinds of cowardice that was likely displayed by the president of Rutgers University, I would say she made the right choice, but I can't even say it's a sad commentary on Rutgers because the whole stinking lot behaves this way. You have to see the pulp I have to read from university administrators. I'll just no, but, but let's make it clear. Rutgers did not disinvite her and, in fact, uh, you know, praised her and, and said she's still invited. And, and you know, so well, uh, uh, the, the, we I'm don't know, going, which you know that's what they are on the record. We don't know what actually transpired in conversation between uh, Miss Rice, uh, Dr. Rice and the president of the university. We just don't know what they said to each other. He may have right. said, you know, you're most welcome to come. He had the unfortunate displeasure of speaking before thousands of people. I public speak. I don't get 35,000, but I don't get a fittance either. Uh, and sometimes audiences are hostile. Large number, and it's not frankly worth the money if you know it's going to happen. But, you know, I, I don't get paid at the dinner table, and uh, they're always, people are always hostile to me. So. Uh, yeah, but remember, this is going to be <laughs> All right, guys, I, I appreciate it. I, I, John Gizzi and Peter Morisi, thank you both. Very much. We will uh, speak again. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, and we'll see you both uh, very, very soon. All right, folks. Uh, we will be creation, the creation of the Camp David Accords. Remember the Camp David Accords. Uh, stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss it right here on the Steve Molesberg Show. It's a region of the world that has known little peace since the beginnings of recorded history. But in September of 1978, President Sadat of Egypt, Prime Minister Begin of Israel, and President Carter of the United States set out to change that. Initiated by the Egyptian leader's proclamation that he would be willing 
to travel anywhere, even Jerusalem, to seek peace. President Carter persuaded the two former enemies to meet with him at Camp David to seek a lasting peace. On the 17th of September, 1978, the Camp David Accords were signed, returning the Sinai to Egypt and creating a framework by which Palestinians could have autonomous and self-governing control over the West Bank and Gaza. During the announcement, President Carter was clear more work needed to be done. The questions that have brought warfare and bitterness to the Middle East for the last 30 years will not be settled overnight. In 1978, President Anwar Sadat and Prime Minister Menachem Begin were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Jimmy Carter's Nobel Prize would come later in 2002 for his decades of